Teste, teste de áudio.
Teste. Vamos iniciar. Teste. Should we start it? All right, welcome back. Um, I I have some brochures for I Street. I'm gonna pass around if you'd like to. Uh, I don't think I have enough, but uh, I can send more if you if you need to. And then we have a website on I Street if you have an, an interest in looking at the the status of our uh, projects. <laughs> Okay, so this part of the uh, of the presentation, uh, we're gonna change gears a little bit and uh, and we'll uh, talk about the highway capacity manual, uh, the sixth edition. Um, how many of you are familiar with the highway capacity manual? Okay, a few. <laughs> All right, so. Um, I will uh, I will talk about what the higher capacity manual is and uh, how it is being developed and what its role um, is and I'll talk specifically about the the sixth uh, the sixth edition um, of the HCM and uh, what to expect uh, from there. So. Um, also, the I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Bastian Schroeder uh, with Kittleson and Associates. Uh, he provided many of the slides because um, uh, he's been on the team uh, that developed the Highway Capacity Manual 6th edition. Um, 
The, um, so the, I'm going to start with uh, an overview of what the higher capacity manual is, what to expect from it, uh, why we develop it, and uh, I'll talk about the higher capacity and quality of service committee, uh, which uh, guides its development. Um, and I served as chair for six years. Um, I was chair when the sixth edition uh, was started and, and, and was published. So um, I... Um, I can, I can share more about uh, what's happening uh, behind the scenes with the higher capacity committee. Uh, I'll talk about um, the different parts of the manual and the software. Um, and I will uh, close with a project that uh, we're working on uh, now to extend the higher capacity manual to, uh, to si the systems uh, type analysis. So uh, the higher capacity manual um, is a manual that uh, helps us evaluate how well a facility um, will work in terms of uh, how it will perform in terms of speed, expected travel times. So you can uh, design a facility with different de uh, design elements, uh, cross-section, horizontal, vertical alignment, um, different uh, expected demands and see how it's going to work, what, it's, uh, what the expected speed will be, uh, what, uh, what expected uh, capacity will be, and so on. Um, it estimates a variety of operational uh, measures, uh, in some cases, uh, queues, uh, volume to capacity ratio, uh, and it, it can be, it is used um, across the US for different types of applications. So uh, one major um, area of application is in, in the US, if there's a new development, let's say a new mall, that comes in, the developer is uh, often required to evaluate how much traffic will be generated from the, from the mall um, and what will be the impacts in terms of the level of service in the surrounding network. And in some cases, if the level of service is going to deteriorate, they are required to build uh, let's say, uh, a new, uh, provide a new traffic light or, or add a lane, um, and they're required to they negotiate in terms of what the developer will pay to put their mall there in order to uh, alleviate any congestion problems. Uh, so that's one type of, uh, of application for the HCM, and, and because of that, um, many uh, local agencies have requirements that say, that relate to the level of service that the higher capacity manual provides. So it's, it's written into policy, and so it becomes very important to have um, uh, well-developed methodologies that can be used because it's real money for developers. Um, the uh, transportation planners use it to uh, develop scenarios at the, at the macroscopic level um, to have preliminary indications of what happens if I put an interchange, um, what happens if I, if I change my signalization, uh, what happens if I, if I put a roundabout or a, an always stop control. So it allows us to evaluate how uh, operationally the system will work. Um, it's um, the, the methods uh, from the, for the HCM, and the first HCM was published in 1950 in the US. Um, and it, uh, it has developed and evolved, and I'll give you a little bit of more background on how it has evolved, um, over, over all these years with uh, funded research and data collection uh, across the US. Uh, and so it is based on um, average conditions across the US. Um, it may not necessarily be accurate for a particular location, but it provides uh, information on how you can calibrate to fit your specific um, location information. Um, and several countries uh, around the world have developed their own HCMs uh, to fit their own conditions. In, in many cases, the, the analysis methods and the, uh, the principles are, are the same, but then uh, driver behavior is different, uh, the vehicle fleet is different, the rules of the road are different, and so you have to adjust uh, the higher capacity manual methods to fit what the specific country's rules or region's rules are. Um, 
Oops. So the the high capacity manual is being developed uh, or is being monitored by the high capacity uh, and quality of service committee, which is uh, it's part of the transportation research board. Um, are you familiar with the transportation research board uh, annual meeting in Washington D.C. every January? It's really cold. <laughs> um, so the uh, the committee meets there. Um, uh, during the annual meeting. Um, it consists of uh, representatives from academia, industry, um, and the private sector, uh, public sector, um, and um, three-year terms, 32 uh, members. And the objective is the committee comes together twice a year, and it uh, reviews new research. It reviews um, feedback received by the community in, uh, in problems that have been identified, errors that have been identified, gaps. Um, they develop new research problem statements, and then they might ask the federal government to pay for, uh, for, uh, for that development of new research. Um, they also review ongoing research, and sometimes, you know, master's PhD students do their own work, and they present to the committee, and if it is, uh, if the committee thinks that this is a valid uh, approach, then they incorporate it into the, um, the HCM. Uh, some of the work, um, I had worked with a, with a PhD or a master's student many years ago uh, on uh, passenger car equivalence. And so even though it was not a federal project, uh, the PCE values were then incorporated into the, into the HCM. So uh, if you have a, uh, in, data, information, models uh, that would enhance the HCM, this is the place to present and uh, have the committee evaluate it. So this year, uh, TRB is uh, January 12th to 16th, and then uh, the committee also meets um, over the summer, um, and this summer meeting is going to be at uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts, um, and it's usually June, July. Uh, I don't think the dates uh, have been set yet. So the, uh, the Highway Capacity Manual has um, um, four different groups. One relates to administration. Uh, so there's a, there are papers that are being submitted to the committee. They're being reviewed. The, the, uh, the group deals with a website and the roster uh, membership. The second group deals with uh, what we call uninterrupted flow facilities. And so this is, these are the methods uh, that relate to freeways, two-lane highways, um, multi-lane highways. And then group three is called the interrupted flow group, and that deals with signals, roundabouts, um, always stop control, two-way stop control. Um, and group four deals with, uh, with cross-cutting issues that cut across many different uh, uh, methods, um, performance measures, uh, bicycles, pedestrians, multimodal um, issues, reliability, uh, travel time reliability, and so topics that are uh, touch on, on all the, the different methods. Uh, let me walk you briefly through the, uh, the history of the, uh, of the HCM. As I said, the first one, uh, 1950, um, and the last one uh, there on the right um, is the, the sixth edition. Um, the first one was only 160 pages long. The sixth edition is 1,238 pages long. Um, and that's the printed uh, part and 960 pages um, available online. So it has expanded very, very significantly. Uh, there are some uh, principles that uh, were put forth in the, in the first um, edition and have evolved over time. Uh, for example, the um, level of service was not there for the first highway capacity manual, but it, uh, it was put forth in the, in the second edition, which came out in 1965. So there were uh, first 1950, 1965, 15 years. Um, after 15 years between uh, the first and second edition, uh, but then uh, we had 85, and then uh, 91, 92, and then 2000, and then uh, 2010, 2015, 
Uh, so uh, the most recent one, which is the, the sixth edition, uh, was published in uh, 2016. Um, it has the four volumes, um, and we'll talk so in more detail on each of the four volumes. There's the uh, introductory and then uninterrupted flow, uh, interrupted flow, and then the online volume four. Um, it uh, has made a big change into multimodal analysis. Um, in the first HCM had uh, nothing on multimodal analysis, but of course that was 1950. The highway network in the US uh, was when the freeways were being developed. There was no consideration for uh, pedestrians, bicycles at the time. The emphasis was on, on vehicles. Uh, but as the automobile has become so much more prevalent um, and there are congestion issues in the city, one of the uh, major uh, efforts in the last several years was to make the HCM multimodal. So as a result, there is a significant um, uh, development of methods for pedestrian and bicycle facilities, um, as well as the interactions between the vehicle mode and the pedestrian mode and the bicycle mode. So um, we'll talk a little bit more later about the interaction between those different uh, components. Um, the new HCM has um, looks into the quantity of travel, so demand versus capacity, the quality of travel, uh, so how well uh, uh, travel times, uh, speeds, and so on. Um, the capacity, how much you can, um, you can accommodate within a network. The fourth dimension of mobility uh, is, is accessibility, but the HCM does not deal with accessibility in terms of uh, what modes are able to provide uh, facilities for different um, origin destinations. Uh, one of the major changes in this uh, latest edition is the, uh, that there's no year attached to it. We, for previous versions, we had 1950, 65, and so on. But um, this time, it's called the sixth edition uh, with no, no year attached to it, with the idea that um, we, if we are replacing specific methods or updating specific methods, then now we can have method 6.2 rather than having the year. So the, um, we are anticipating that there will be uh, changes to, to methods which can be incorporated into the existing edition without having to redo the entire uh, manual. And uh, so it's structured in a way where it makes it more uh, modular and we can replace a chapter with a new method once it's, uh, it's being developed. Um, questions so far? on the HCM, generally. Okay, if not, then I'll, uh, I'll talk about the first, uh, the first volume uh, and what, uh, what it includes. And I want to focus specifically on the, on the concept of, uh, of capacity, because I, I think it is a, uh, it is a critical issue um, and uh, it doesn't get as much attention, I think, as it, as it needs to. So the, the first volume in the HCM has uh, uh, material that uh, describes generally specific aspects for operations, the performance measures, uh, types of applications that the HCM addresses, um, what are uh, the definitions and the concepts, um, what, uh, uh, what is quality of service, how the level of service is defined. And these are topics that are not expected to change significantly um, over time. Um, the, uh, let me highlight a couple of things. One is the um, HCM and alternative analysis tools. And this is primarily for addressing um, simulation, micro simulation uh, specifically. Are you familiar with micro simulation? Have you been using uh, tools like Visim or Aimsan? Some of them. 
Uh, okay, all right. Uh, so micro simulation is is uh, is a very important tool that uh, became more prevalent uh, in more uh, more recent times. When the 1958 CM came out, uh, of course there were no computers at the time, so there was no micro simulation. But with computers becoming more prevalent and, and microscopic uh, simulation tools uh, becoming available, um, there was a shift. So that's, you know, simulation is a different tool, but you can get maybe similar information when you uh, use simulation versus when you use the HCM. So does that make the HCM um, obsolete? And the answer is no, for a couple of reasons. One, the HCM uh, gives you tools that are, you can use it quickly uh, for a more macroscopic level analysis, it doesn't require as, as much input. Um, so it's, um, from a practitioner's point of view, it's cheaper to use and analyze and evaluate um, how quickly, you know, very quickly, if a certain design will work at what level of service you are expected uh, to be. Uh, number two, micro simulators are commercially available, are, are developed by, uh, by commercial um, entities, and uh, in many cases they are not peer-reviewed. Uh, they're actually, in many cases, they're viewed as black boxes. So you put in input, you don't know what the analysis, what the assumptions are, you don't know how the, what models the developer is using, you get an output, uh, but how do you know? Is that accurate or not? There is no external review of what uh, the performance will be, and even though in micro simulation, um, you can have 3D animation and you can see the vehicles running through your network and so on. It's, if you know what you're doing, it's very easy to provide a solution that everything looks great in the simulator, but it really isn't. So you have to really know how the micro simulator works, uh, be very familiar with it and know where to look if you are reviewing such a model. Uh, and in, in some cases, things are, are hidden. Um, so it's, it is uh, the HCM, uh, on the other hand, because it's, uh, the, the research is um, available, um, the data are available, um, the methods are, are transparent, you know what the relationships are, um, and uh, you are you're able to have a better, more informed um, uh, kind of an evaluation of what your, how your system um, will work. Um, so there is, there is a place for both. Uh, with micro simulation, what you're able to do is, uh, and the HCM provides within its chapter what the limitations are. So you can run uh, your analysis in the HCM, but it says these are the limitations. If, this is, if these are your conditions, you need to go to micro simulation. One of the main um, uh, benefits of using micro simulations that you can do um, analysis and, and vary your um, uh, and have interacting cues and see how the cues from one location affect one a downstream and an upstream would interact which is something that the HCM analysis is uh, is, is not able to do uh, and there are conditions like that where uh, you know you can build something in simulation which uh, condition that the HCM is not able to analyze. But if the conditions are being able to be analyzed by the HCM, you m it's easier, faster, fewer data required to run an HCM analysis relatively quickly. Um, the, um <coughs> the introductory uh, volume also gives um, definitions on glossary and, and symbols used throughout the manual, and it has a Primer, which is supposed to be for uh, executives um, in transportation agencies, just to give them an overview of what to expect when you're doing an HCM type um, analysis, how it works, what the basic um, assumptions are. Um, one of the concepts uh, in traffic operations um, in chapter four is on capacity. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about capacity and what it means um, <coughs> and what the difficulties are with, uh, with defining, measuring capacity. Um, 
the sixth edition um, defines capacity uh, by considering what we call the pre-breakdown um, NQ discharge capacity. So in other words, um, we define the maximum throughput that the facility can accommodate in terms of whether it is measured before you reach breakdown, before you go into congested conditions. You have, if you measure that, you'll get one number. After you have breakdown, you have stop and go traffic. If you try to measure the maximum, you'll get a different number. And that is roughly 10% less than if you, so the difference between the two, the pre-breakdown and the discharge uh, throughput, maximum throughput is about 10% difference. Previous HCM editions ignored that. They did not look at um, the different um, throughputs that you would get under different conditions. The previous assumption was if you have a, let's say, a freeway merge, um, you, as your flow increases and increases, eventually you reach a point which is uh, termed capacity, and then you reach breakdown. You, you start to have stop and go conditions, and that point you reach uh, is the maximum that you will observe. Um, and when we collect data, we find that that's not as easy to, uh, to measure and, um, and identify. Uh, so it, some of the issues that we were seeing uh, through data collection were addressed in, the, in this most recent um, edition of the HCM. Um, so um, the definition of capacity is um, the um, maximum expected uh, throughput under prevailing um, conditions. And that has been the definition over many years, uh, probably with the, uh, the 1950 uh, manual was uh, defining prevailing capacity, uh, ideal capacity. If you go back to the 1950, you will see that there was kind of a confusion in, in the definition of capacity. And uh, now that we have the opportunity to collect a lot more data, uh, we're able to see better um, patterns in terms of what, uh, how capacity can be defined. So let me show you what the data are showing in terms of, um, of capacity. Uh, uh, the horizontal axis here shows time. Uh, vertical on, on this side uh, shows uh, volume. And the vertical on the, on the right side um, shows uh, uh, speed. Um, the, the red shows you uh, how flow um, uh, fluctuates. And the green uh, shows you the speed. Um, when we collect data at the location where we expect to have a uh, breakdown, where we expect to reach um, stop and go conditions, the pattern that we see is that there is a, your flow would fluctuate uh, right before. Um, your speed will reach a point where it will just collapse. It will uh, be reduced by maybe 10, 15 miles an hour, sometimes more, and it happens from one time interval to another. Um, when, uh, when that happens, then, in theory, based on, on theory, you would say, okay, the point where that happens, the, the uh, breakdown happens, is my capacity, right? But if I look into the flow, this is the breakdown flow that corresponds to the time my speed starts to drop. So according to the theory so far, this should be my capacity. But our data are showing that this is not the maximum. So the maximum is here. It happened several time periods uh, before the breakdown. So um, the theory is we'll reach the maximum, we'll get into congestion. But the, in practice, that's not what happens. So uh, if you are a researcher and you're trying to determine what is capacity now, what should I use? You have options. You can say, OK, it's the breakdown flow, which is not the maximum. You can say it's the maximum pre-breakdown pre flow. 
And then you have another number which uh, relates to the uh, maximum after capacity, uh, after, after breakdown happens. And so if you do this kind of an exercise for multiple sites in multiple days, even at the same site, every day you collect data, you'll see a different pattern. It, you will not always see the same thing. Sometimes it will break um, at uh, 2,000, sometimes it will be 1,500, so, and it will fluctuate. And so you can, you can get a distribution of what that will, um, will look like. So, yeah. Yes. We've looked at many different uh, ways. The HCM uses the 15 minutes. And so if you want to follow the HCM analysis, you should be l looking at 15 minute data, which don't have as much fluctuation. Uh, if you want, you can also go into five minutes, um, in which case you can more clearly show this. So with m five minutes, you don't ca cover the variability that, that you see, and it's clearer to show it. But it really depends on the, um, on the application. We have some of our applications are for um, RAM metering, which requires like one minute intervals. Some applications, if you're looking into HCM, it would be the 15 minute interval analysis. Yeah, so it, it really depends on your application. Yeah, the intervals, um, the interval you use will affect definitely the numbers that you will get. Yes, absolutely. You have much less variability, and so you have more average values the larger your uh, your interval is. Is that your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mean the maximum break breakdown? Yeah. The breakdown? Yeah. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, between that and the next one. Yes, right. With yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, again, based on the side, you can decide what that drop needs to be uh, or, or what the drop is and how to define that breakdown happens based on it. And um, it can fluctuate ba with different sites. Yeah. Exactly. You won't have as big of, yes, exactly. You will, you will not have that big of a fluctuation. But uh, the, the shorter the interval, the more you're able to see the differences. Yeah. Um, so if you do that with many sites, and we, we, we did that um, f uh, with freeways across uh, the US, and you take each one of those um, measures and you know I'm, I'm sure there are many other measures that one can use to define capacity um, but you can see what uh, the fluctuation in the range of values are for each um, for each of the sites so let's take the first one Minneapolis we had some breakdowns at 1350 to 2370 so that's a thousand vehicles difference that's huge if you uh, if you anticipate much higher capacities, uh, there was some event there at 1350 that triggered a uh, breakdown at a relatively low uh, throughput value. Um, the maximum pre-breakdown, also uh, about 500 vehicles um, variability. We also did the average flow for the 10 minutes before the breakdown, um, again, five, 600 uh, vehicle difference. Um, what were Finding those that when you look at the average discharge flow, the, the maximum throughput after breakdown happens, uh, you have slightly lower variability. It's, uh, things are more stable when, the, when you have stop and go traffic. There are not that many uh, decisions that drivers um, are making, and so your, uh, your range of values uh, is a little bit uh, more, uh, more narrow. But 
if you are in a position where you need to measure uh, capacity, look at all the options you have. It's, a, it's really a, a moving target. The HCM right now um, is defining capacity, ideal capacity, so passenger car equivalents and uh, uh, so only passenger cars and uh, uh, um, 12 foot lanes and flat terrain and all of that at 2300 uh, is the maximum, 2300 passenger cars per vehicle uh, per lane for uh, ideal uh, freeway conditions. Um, you, you get you very seldom get close to that, and only if you go to the maximum pre-breakdown flow. If you, if you pick the maximum, then okay, you are approximating it, but it's not sustainable. Um, and it's not, not only is it not sustainable, but it, uh, it doesn't happen regularly. So we are, in many ways, with the HCM, we are overestimating what our maximum throughput will be. And if you're uh, if you're trying to uh, systematically collect information on capacity, um, you should be looking at it more um, as a distribution rather than a, a, a specific number. Uh, so the definition that I was showing earlier, uh, with the sixth edition, it's moving closer to that, but I think we have still ways to go in, in terms of um, defining uh, capacity in a, in a consistent uh, way. Um, and I th what I think is important also is to say um, you, for different purposes, you may need different measures of, of capacity. If you're operating a facility, um, it's important that you know what, um, what your breakdown flow is or what your uh, how, how flow would be distributed and perhaps how to minimize uh, or how to maximize the throughput based on uh, traffic management um, strategies. If you are designing a facility, maybe you want to be more conservative and you want to use a different um, measure uh, for uh, you know, uh, deciding how many lanes uh, your facility is going to have. So, I think that for different types of applications, you may need different uh, types of capacity-related uh, measures um, that need to be used. So what, uh, what do we know now about uh, capacity? First, that the theory, and you've seen the speed flow relationships, the curves that show the capacity as the maximum. Yes, in th that's the theory, but uh, in practice it doesn't work. Uh, we don't, that's not the way uh, traffic uh, operates. We have a discrepancy in terms of the maximum throughput before uh, breakdown and after uh, breakdown. Um, it is important if we are, uh, as practitioners, as researchers, if we're measuring capacity, that we do it in a consistent way, and that will help us uh, maximize comparisons and be able to evaluate how different facilities operate. Um, so, and, and even uh, define for different types of applications what that maximum throughput should be. We, I may even go as far as saying we shouldn't be calling, we shouldn't be using the term capacity. We should be saying that's the maximum throughput for this. That's the maximum throughput for that, and the, um, you know, the expected value. So that there is no, we, sh we move away from this concept of there's one capacity, because there isn't. Um, one of the interesting uh, uh, things that we found is that the per lane capacity uh, changes based on the number of lanes. So in other words, if you have a three lane freeway, you are able to get higher throughput than if you have a two-lane facility or a four-lane facility. With a two-lane facility, it seems you don't have, vehicles don't have as much an opportunity to change lanes. And with the, it seems like with the three-lane facility, you have uh, it's kind of an optimal way to, to maximize the, the utilization of the facility. When you go to four, five, six lanes on the freeway, it's not used as effectively. So, so adding one more lane is not going to get you um, that, uh, that much, um, as much uh, when you go from a 4 to a 5 or from a 5 to a 6. So uh, there are some facilities in the US where you have express lanes and local lanes. 
And so splitting it into three lanes and three lanes uh, may be a better design than having one with six lanes. You, you, you will be able to have more uh, higher throughput for, for the facility. Um, and also to last point here is that um, in order to measure capacity, to know that you've reached capacity, you have to have breakdown. There is no other way. So uh, in order to be able to get to the maximum throughput, you should be able to observe uh, some kind of, uh, of breakdown. And you have different types of breakdown when you are, when the facility is like a merge and the breakdown happens because of the merge versus if you have a, a slow moving trucks on an upgrade and you have a freeway uh, with uh, no change in the number of lanes, you have a very different uh, type of a, of a breakdown. And each one gives us a different um, uh, pattern in terms of the way speed uh, is reduced. If you have a spillback from another facility, the, the speed uh, drops more gradually. If you have a spillback because of a merge, your speed drops uh, more abruptly. So uh, keep that in mind if you're doing measurements with, um, uh, with breakdown. Uh, questions on, uh, on capacity? Okay. Um, the next uh, um, volume we're going to talk about is on uh, uninterrupted flow. It is primarily freeways, multi-lane um, highways, <coughs> two-lane highways. Um, and freeways include basic freeway segments, uh, ramps, weaves. Um, and uh, one of the new um, Topics under interrupt under the within the HCM is the reliability analysis, uh, travel time reliability. Are you at all familiar with travel time reliability measures? Okay, we'll we'll talk about that. So uh, for freeways, um, <coughs> here are the, the the way the HCM analyzes uh, freeways is, uh, and this is based on uh, the history of the HCM. When the HCM was first being developed in the 1950s, um, there was not much congestion. The, the most of the interest was on uh, specific types of designs and how the operations of those designs uh, would work. And so <coughs> the um, analysis was looking at a merge segment. So this is a diverge segment. This is a weave. And the weave is when you have a um, uh, acceleration or uh, uh, an auxiliary lane that connects an on-ramp with an off-ramp. Uh, if you have an on-ramp followed by an off-ramp, but they're not connected, those uh, would be analyzed as a merge and a diverge. Um, a basic freeway segment is when you have uh, no changes in, in the number of lanes, and then you have a lane drop or a, or a lane addition. So these are different components um, of the network. And so traditionally, they were looking at um, each of them analyzed separately. <coughs> um, the problem with uh, only considering undersaturated conditions is that when you go into oversaturated conditions, what happens on the merge affects the upstream section, whatever that is, if it's a basic freeway segment. If you're only looking at the basic freeway segment without looking at what happened what happens downstream, and if that is creating cues that spill back, then your, uh, your analysis will g really give you uh, bad, bad information. So uh, <coughs> when you, with the current system that we have, it's really necessary to look at the freeway as a system. So in addition to those initial types of methods that looked at the merge and the diverge and so on, uh, over the last uh, couple of editions of the HCM, we've been looking at freeway systems to be able to analyze um, oversaturated conditions. And so the way that the freeway systems analysis works is <coughs> you um, have to look at multiple time intervals to be able to monitor how conge uh, congestion uh, starts and it builds and you get into stop and go traffic and then it dissipates. 
and also look at the facility with a sequence of, uh, um, of segments. So if uh, in my facility I have a diverge fo followed by a basic, followed by a merge, um, and so on, I have to look at the entire system um, in such a way where that my most downstream section operates freely, so there's no congestion at the first downstream. Um, because if there is, then I'm missing um, the spillback that uh, affects that particular segment. So I have to start with the first, the most downstream uh, segment operating in, in free flow. Um, and I have to start with the, my first time interval free flow and my last interval free flow. So it has, you have to have kind of a, a box around that in time and space so that you're able to evaluate um, the spillback and how it evolves from one time uh, period to another. So uh, what these boxes show um, is average speed for the segment. So this basic segment operates freely. The congestion really um, uh, starts here where you have slightly um, lower uh, speeds but the real congestion seems to be generated by this merge. Uh, you have speeds of 35, 34, and so on. So if you look at this, you have kind of reduced speeds um, starting from, from this interval. Um, then you go into congestion. The congestion starts to spread further upstream and further upstream. <coughs> um, and then when you get to this interval, now it starts to dissipate and your queue starts to, um, to shrink. Um, have you, have any of you learned about shockwave analysis? Yeah, so this is kind of a shockwave. Uh, you can think of this as a shockwave, uh, backward forming and then backward, uh, uh, let's see, and then uh, let's see, f f dissipating. So you have, uh, you have shock waves that form um, as part of this, and so in the HCM analysis, you're able to look at multiple time intervals and look at time and space um, for your freeway system. <coughs> uh, so generally, that's how the freeway systems analysis works. Now, <coughs> um, in the most recent HCM, in the six sixth edition, one of the concepts that was added was this issue of reliability. Um, typically, um, analysis has looked at average conditions. So the annual average um, or the analysis for a particular time period, a particular day, and so on. But um, the way travelers experience the way the uh, facility operates, uh, it fluctuates. So you have Every day you travel, sometimes you have more uh, delay, sometimes less delay, so you have a significant fluctuation. And that's not reflected in the way um, we as transportation prof professionals have been evaluating the way the facility works. Um, so if you are um, making um, an improvement in the average, if you're only looking at the average day, you're making some improvement, uh, but you don't know what happens uh, in the life of the traveler. So the reliability concept came from the idea of how travelers experience um, congestion and travel times versus how we as analysts um, evaluate um, conditions. And so um, this led to an evaluation, um, an additional way to evaluate the facility, <coughs> looking at how it operates under different conditions throughout the year um, so that we are able to, in that case, evaluate things like um, the removal of incidents. Because if there's an incident, you as a traveler <coughs> will, um, um, will experience much increased travel time. Um, if you have multiple incidents throughout the year, then you'll be really frustrated because you'll have a lot of delays over many days. If the, if the agency is able to reduce the number of incidents or make the removal and the reaction to that much faster, then you as a traveler will benefit. Um, 
but if we're only looking at one average day, um, we're not capturing the way an agency might be able to operate uh, a facility. Same with things like uh, RAM metering or, uh, or other strategies for uh, the management of, of the facility. So in this most recent HCM, the analysis looks at the way we, uh, the, a facility would operate over multiple days, not just one um, average. Um, so if you are looking at the travel time over a freeway facility, and you collect data throughout the year, you'll get some kind of a distribution. Um, and uh, most of these would represent your non-congested times um, when uh, you don't have incidents or anything like that. And these would represent some of your most uh, extreme events. Maybe there was a special event. Maybe there was a heavy uh, snowstorm or uh, uh, rainfall. Uh, maybe a combination of those. And so you have a few of these happening over here with very high travel times, but relatively low frequencies. Uh, but from a traveler's perspective, you want to minimize these. Um, if you're only looking at the average travel time uh, over one day, you're not looking at the experience of the traveler over, uh, uh, over the year. And so based on this concept, um, the, um, in the US, we have developed this concept of travel time reliability. And there are um, <coughs> two different uh, ways to think about it. Uh, one is reliability, and the other is variability. And I'll talk about both. Reliability, and that's a concept that's, that's used when you evaluate different types of equipment, where you're saying, you know, this particular equipment works 85% of the time. So its reliability is 85%. Um, we have uh, the concept of uh, airline reliability. Um, what percent of time a particular route is on time? And airlines use that. Um, in, the, in the US, there's the concept of, uh, we have um, uh, HOT lanes, high occupancy toll lanes. And because people pay, they are promised a certain reliability. So uh, what percent of the time are you able to keep speeds above a higher, uh, ab above a certain level? So this <coughs> gives you the concept of reliability. You measure um, uh, the travel times throughout the year, and you're saying, OK, what's the reliability if you, uh, you, know, you want to maintain a certain uh, limit in your travel time? What's the reliability of that facility? <coughs> and that, um, the idea is that this relates more closely to what the traveler experiences over a, over a year. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, the, the different agencies have different techniques. For example, Bluetooth uh, is being used in, in several facilities. What, uh, what the HCM does, and I'll show a couple of slides uh, on that, is how to uh, estimate it based on anticipated uh, policies for the facility. Uh, but yeah, the different agencies do it uh, in different ways, and that's a, it's, it's a, an important way how to, how to measure it, and that's a whole different uh, area, but I think very, very important. Um. <coughs> yes, yes. So, uh, b based on the, um, uh, on the accuracy of different devices, um, and some are more accurate uh, under um, uh, high demand conditions, some are not. Like the, the, the Bluetooth, uh, we've done some experiments. When, when you have congested conditions, they may not be as accurate. And it's, that's when you need them the most, but, and they, that's when they, they're not doing as well. But there are um, you know, um, calculations based on detection and, and things like that. But the most accurate would be if you were able to track a particular vehicle um, origin destination. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, it's actually something that the Florida Turnpike uh, is using because they have uh <coughs> you have a transponder in your vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, to pay the toll, but they use that information also to measure travel times from one location to the other. But it's a more of a closed system, and it's easier to do it. Um, if you wanted to have a, a wider type of a uh, data collection for that, you need high uh, penetration in order to be able to have the matches from origin to destination. Yeah. Um, so, um, the sources of that reliability or variability <coughs> are variations in demand, uh, the presence of, uh, of incidents, um, anything related to severe weather, um, and work zones or special events. So each of these may contribute to variability in the in the travel time. So for us to be able to uh, to calculate um, travel expected travel time, we need to be able to uh, identify things like how many incidents do you expect to have in a year, or how many you have had, or how many uh, uh, weather events, how many um, work zone closures, how many uh, special events. And so if you are um, to evaluate, okay, if I have a new policy in incident removal, what will be the change or the expected change from what I have now to what I, um, I expect to have? So the... Um, the way that the HCM does the reliability type analysis is, you know how I was showing you uh, how a freeway um, would be analyzed uh, for a particular time period. Now you need to do this type of analysis for each day of the year um, you have an interest in, in evaluating. So if you have uh, the same type of analysis, uh, each one should give you um, the event that is anticipated, the incident, the special event um, throughout the year. And so what you can evaluate from there is um, you can do what-if scenarios of if I make a change, let's say in the policies for uh, work zone closures, um, and I um, eliminate uh, my um <coughs> the time uh, work zones during that time of analysis. What will that do to the travel time reliability? Or if I implement a new policy for incident removal uh, or, uh, or travel man traffic uh, management, what will that do to the expected reliability? So you can, um, you can, do, uh, you can evaluate different policy scenarios um, for that. Um, so you can do this type of analysis for a specific study period. You can do it for the entire day, depending on what uh, what you're interested in uh, in focusing on. Um, so, what uh, this allows us to do is to do a more thorough evaluation, or what we call ATDM, or Advanced Traffic Management, uh, uh, Traffic Demand Management Strategies, and those may fluctuate by study period and fluctuate throughout the year. So it can give you a better estimate of um, implementation of the strategy and the benefits that you would expect in terms of reliability. Um, and those strategies uh, relate to things like RAM metering. Um, you know what RAM metering is? When you have a traffic light at the end of the ramp. Uh, so instead of having free-flowing uh, traffic, you have a traffic light that is set to accept a certain number of vehicles uh, per minute, maybe one vehicle, uh, maybe a couple of vehicles per minute um, or so. And that allows you to control the amount of traffic you get on, on the freeway. Um, there are other strategies, uh, for example, shoulder use during congested uh, conditions uh, or high occupancy uh, toll lanes um, that operate during certain times. So, so you can uh, modify your um, analysis of a particular time period by considering what strategy uh, is being implemented. So what the HCM provides is a way <coughs> to analyze 
those types of um, like variable speed limits, highway, uh, occup uh, high occupancy toll lanes, ramp metering, um, and you can evaluate what the impact will be in terms of reliability. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. Um, <coughs> the um, one of the other uh, new um, changes in the uh, in the ETM is the inclusion of a new generic speed flow model um, for freeways instead of providing the final. Uh, model so that now you can uh, develop your own uh, model based on free flow, uh, based on your, uh, for, for whatever free flow speed uh, you have rather than having to interpolate. You can get directly into an, uh, the equation. Um, these are just some of the highlights from uh, the uninterrupted uh, flow. Um, and unless there are any questions, I'll go into interrupted flow and what's expected there or what's available there. Okay. Um, <coughs> in interrupted flow, as I said, tho that includes intersections, segments, and so on. Uh, and one of the um, new directions uh, um, of, of that component is to in uh, include segments and arterials um, and m move more toward the systems analysis for exactly the same reasons as, as for freeways, that the spillback um, and uh, when you have a congestion, one segment affects the other, and so it is. Uh, it, is it would not be correct to just look at a particular segment um, on its own when you have congested conditions. Uh, so the um, the list here shows the chapters under um, interrupted flow. It starts with. Uh, uh, facilities, urban street facilities that look at um, longer segments. Uh, uh, there's a reliability um, evaluation also for urban streets. Uh, and then we have the uh, signalized intersections, uh, roundabout, stop control intersections, and those are kind of the, uh, the analysis chapters that have been there for a longer amount of time. Um, there's been a lot more of a multi-model um, uh, tool development within the interrupted flow, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So this is um, what the, uh, the urban streets um, analysis does, and this is, uh, the, uh, these are images of an uh, urban street facility where you're looking at uh, a combination of uh, different intersection uh, treatments, and you put it all together to evaluate the um, the system, uh, the the urban um, uh, street as a system. Um, one of the um, important points there is that <coughs> when you're looking at um, the entire urban street, now we we have to look at the arrival patterns that you have from one intersection to the other. Uh, Excuse me, have you um, looked into or have you used at all the Transit 7F um, platoon dispersion model uh, that looks into signal control optimization? This uh, Transit 7F was a, a model that was developed in England uh, many years ago that looked into um, how to optimize signal control in the corridor uh, by anticipating how platoons would form and disperse throughout the corridor. Um, so the ETM kind of now uses uh, that principle of when uh, traffic is being released from this intersection, how do they form uh, platoons, how those platoons dissipate as some vehicles go faster, some go slower, um, and what is the expected arrival uh, pattern um, at the downstream intersection so that when we set the um, signalization and the offsets between one intersection and the downstream, how to, uh, how to optimize it so that we have fewer vehicles stopping um, when they go through the, um, uh, the arterial. So there's, a, there's an arrival flow profile um, prediction within, uh, within this module. Um, and by, by doing that, you're able to um, kind of anticipate what your 
arrival flow profile will be, and based on that, what the um, expected delay will be based on your uh, signalization. Uh, so you can do actually um, uh, trial and error type um, analysis on your offsets to see how the uh, offset will um, will affect the the delay for your system. Um, Multi-model trade-offs. Um, as I said, because the the HCM uh, or the um, um, local agencies in the U.S. have been requesting more of an impact of the um, or the interactions between pedestrians, bicycles, um, and um, and vehicles. There's been more of a push to have those interactions included within um, the methodologies. With um, previous HCMs, the focus, uh, and that's, that has been one of the criticisms in the US, the focus has been more on vehicular traffic. So when you're setting up uh, your performance measurement, if you're only including vehicular measures, then you're improving the highway system and improving and improving, but you're not considering what you're doing to the pedestrians and the bicycles. So the idea is that you want to consider all the modes together. Um, so and, and consider the way a change you make in the vehicle um, environment uh, will affect the, uh, the pedestrians um, and the bicycles. And so uh, this kind of summarizes what those, um, what those uh, trade-offs are. And so, for example, if you have um, uh, from the auto, uh, if you have uh, more extent, uh, longer cycle lengths, that impacts your uh, your pedestrians, it would uh, uh, maybe affect the, the conflicts, it would, re uh, require, it would result in additional delay to pedestrians. So you can use information from one mode to analyze what's, what's happening in the, uh, in the other mode. And I should say, uh, for transit, um, transit used to be part of the HCM at some point, but now there's a different manual that's called the Transit Capacity Manual, uh, that um, uses some information from here and vice versa. So the HCM uses some transit information, but now they're two, uh, two separate manuals. Um, are you familiar at all with the transit capacity manual? Yeah. Okay. There's, it's, a, it's a manual that specifically focuses on, uh, on transit operations. Um, roundabouts. Um, do you have roundabouts generally? Are they popular here? Yes. Okay. And do ah, okay. All right. Good. Uh, so and they w they operate as uh, uh, without traffic lights, right? They're just uh, tradition or uh, the yeah the right definition or the correct definition of a roundabout. Some sometimes they're traffic circles, uh, you know, when they have um, signals. So uh, the ATM has a new. Um, set of equations for roundabouts um, in, in the US. Roundabouts uh, didn't used to be at all uh, popular. They're becoming more popular. Um, so when uh, roundabouts were first introduced into the HCM, there weren't enough data um, to, to collect from the US. So many of the models came from, uh, from Europe. <coughs> but um, in Europe, drivers are very comfortable with roundabouts, but in the, in the US, they aren't. And so uh, it had been very difficult to calibrate based on local conditions. That's gradually changing, uh, and people are becoming more comfortable. Um, and, and you know, some locations, some states have embraced roundabouts, so you see a lot more. Um, and so that their drivers are are more more comfortable. Um, so as we are uh, getting more data, the roundabout uh, capacity models have evolved also for, uh, for the HCM. Um, so there's uh, now the um, analysis for a one lane, single lane uh, roundabout. There is a multi-lane roundabout um, uh, models and, uh, and so on. The, the analysis still looks at single approach. So it looks at the demand from the cir circulating uh, traffic stream and the demand from the um, arriving uh, approach, it doesn't look at the roundabout as one. And I think that's a, 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 
we should go to the next step of looking at the roundabout as a, as a system, but it has not happened yet. Um, are there models like that that you use here in, in Brazil? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Oh. oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. No, that's. Uh, I think that's. Uh, that's good that it uh, it operates that way. I don't know that. Uh, um, some of the roundabouts that we have around Gainesville that they have, they don't have that much traffic, uh, pedestrian traffic to, to stop that. Uh, there's one that's close to my home where uh, there's uh, students and so they have a crossing guard there during uh, the school year and they stop the traffic for pedestrians to cross. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's. I like that technique. I'll suggest to the city of Gainesville if they have problems with. Uh, yeah. You just go around and clear it up. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, how are we doing on time? Yeah? How much more? 10, 15 minutes? Okay. Uh, so the um, uh, another interesting, uh, relatively new chapter is new um, uh, analysis for ramp terminals. So, um, uh, interchanges, uh, diamonds, spui, um, and uh, uh, DDIs, uh, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And so there's a new uh, method that has looked into um, what's called the diverging diamond interchange. Um, have you seen this design before? Uh, 
Okay. So the the okay. So the diamond interchange. This is the classic diamond where you have an off ramp. Uh, followed by an on-ramp on, on either direction. So this is the freeway and that's the arterial. And so you, you are connecting the freeway with the arterial through either a diamond or a uh, partial clover leaf or, or what's called a SPUI, single point urban interchange. Um, but then there is this um, uh, DDI, which was created to uh, minimize the congestion through an interchange. So what it does is, you, if you're arriving, this is your um, um, arterial and this is your freeway. So you're, you're coming on, you're switching to the other side. So now the traffic goes here. So in once when, you, when you do that, you're allowing the left turn to happen um, without being uh, interrupted, and then the same from the other way. So there is a crisscross to uh, maximize the amount of traffic you get on the left turn, because with the diamonds, what, uh, what was happening is uh, you had really long uh, left turn queues, and they impact, um, the, they create spillback on, on the bridge, and the bridge is expensive to build additional storage. So uh, this is called the diverging diamond. And so now the HCM has um, analysis um, uh, methods for that. There are some other um, intersections, um, alternative intersections. Again, most of them are for um, uh, accommodating left turns, basically. Um, to So you're switching, you're creating U-turns. Um, and I think those are very interesting. Uh, there's different designs. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has uh, different uh, uh, types of uh, uh, those types of designs. This is a, uh, it's called an RCAT, restricted crossing U-turn. Um, this is with uh, a slightly modified design. Uh, this is the median U-turn. Again, you're channelizing now vehicles to avoid the left turns. You're channelizing them. Uh, to go down the street and then come back in, um, in a U-turn. So several different types of, uh, of designs, and most of them are to uh, reduce the left turn uh, conflicts, because these are the major problem in uh, signalized intersections. Any, if there aren't any questions, I'll go into the volume four. Um, and this is a... a this is an online um, only. Um, you can actually uh, get access to that. Um, you can just uh, go in and register. It's available available at the hcmvolume4.org. Uh, you don't even have to have the um, uh, the HCM purchased, um, and it has. Um, background on the different methods and, um, ana and research projects that uh, resulted in the development of the HCM. Um, you can have uh, information on uh, existing uh, errata. So errata are uh, typos, problems with methods that have been identified and update the HCM. All that information uh, is provided here. Um, and uh, you, there's also the technical reference library, which has uh, reports uh, that have led to the development of the HCM. Everything is available there. Um, you can have, uh, uh, you can ask questions there. Uh, there are several uh, different discussion fora where you can, if you have a question, uh, you can you can post it. In the U.S., we also have the ITE. Uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers. I don't know if you have a chapter here or uh, membership, but uh, uh, if you have a membership, then there's an online uh, discussion forum and people sometimes ask HCM related questions there. Um, so in, in summary now, the, the HCM is moving more toward uh, multi-model um, evaluation. It's moving more toward the travel time reliability, and looking at um, the performance of, a s of the highway system, um, uh, more than just looking at the average or looking at the one uh, analysis period. Um, 
there's more on managed lanes, so lanes that are uh, high occupancy or charge at all. Are there any uh, toll lanes, uh, freeway toll lanes, or the, the entire facility is tolled? Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, that's a very different concept. In the U.S., there are uh, you can you can have a, only a lane that is tolled, and uh, as I was saying earlier, you're you're expected to uh, you want to if you want to pay to get there faster. Um, those are sometimes called as Lexus lanes. <laughs> But uh, th those are uh, qu getting uh, uh, quite popular. So um, there's a variety of applications that the HCM addresses, including planning, uh, planning level applications, uh, more macroscopic, um, and guidance on when to use uh, simulation versus um, the HCM. Uh, I want to show you just quickly a couple of screenshots from the high capacity software. I don't know if you have, uh, are you, do you use the high capacity software? No? Okay, okay. Uh, it basically implements the high capacity manual uh, methods um, as they're becoming much more uh, uh, complicated. It's, you don't want to use a, uh, you know, you don't want to calculate by hand, um, so there's uh, many of the of the applications are now uh, available um, uh, through um, uh, analytical tools. In the HCS, like I said, it's a it's the UF tool. Uh, you can analyze freeways, um, all all the different segments, including the freeway systems analysis. Um, this is the freeway facilities. Uh, report you can get uh, uh, all the reliability measures, uh, related measures. You can get segment information. Um, this this show just input screen and um, an output um, screen and performance measures um, and uh, streets. Uh, this is the arterial uh, streets uh, results and uh, and screens. Um, Interchanges, uh, signalization information, and graphics related to that, um, and intersections. Um, and uh, one of the newer uh, components that the Mactrans has incorporated is um, connection with Transmodeler, uh, which is a uh, simulator. So if you have your uh, analysis in the HCM, you can, con and if you have Transmodeler, you can connect the two. Um, so there's, uh, McTarns is looking into those types of connections with multiple um, uh, simulation uh, model providers. Uh, questions so far? Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention is one of the, the projects that we're, uh, one project that we're working on, it's a new uh, method for looking into connecting freeways to arterials. Um, uh, we have the contract at the University of Florida. We're working with uh, Cambridge Systematics um, and Alex Cabardon is from, uh, from UC Berkeley. And we're developing a method where we can um, analyze what happens when you have spillback from one facility to the other. Um, the HCM right now is only looking at either freeways or arterials. So the, the question is, if you have an arterial that spill back, spills back into a freeway, how do you analyze it? Well, th so this is what we're, um, we're doing under, uh, under, under this contract. So what um, the ultimate uh, objective is to be able to estimate the travel time from a given origin to a given destination if you have, uh, say in this case, a DDI followed by a, a, a SPUI and perhaps you have a freeway, uh, system in the middle so that you can uh, build a corridor and look at travel times through an arterial and, and a freeway. And the, um, this becomes an issue when you have congestion. If you don't have congestion, that's not an issue. Um, but it, when you have congestion, this is kind of what uh, you might expect. And this is what we see from, uh, from our data. When you have a, a spillback from an arterial, like in this case, you have a queue that is maybe you have a traffic light uh, that generates this queue and then you have a, uh, the queue that extends 
uh, into the freeway, what, uh, what we're finding is that the impact on a lane-by-lane -lane basis is different, so you might have longer queues. Um, and the, the, the formation of the queue changes by lane. And so one of the things that we're doing uh, is converting the analysis to a lane-by-lane -lane, uh, pattern. Um, and uh, do you, any of you know Fabio Sasahana? He graduated from uh, here, but the... Uh, ah, Sao Paulo, yes, that's right. So he graduated from there, but uh, so anyway, he's a PhD student at UF and he's managing uh, this project. He's, he's doing a great job. He's finishing his dissertation on looking at spillback um, on lane by lane for, um, for freeways. So these, these graphs uh, he has developed. Um, so we're looking at uh, evaluating each um, lane um, and uh, how we're able to predict what happens on a lane-by-lane -lane basis, what the queue length will be, uh, and what the operations um, will be. So uh, uh, developing models that predict the queue spillback into freeways um, and also uh, queue spillback into, um, into arterials and, uh, and traffic signals. And we're working with, um, with McTrans to implement this in a, a software application. Uh, uh, if you have an interest in, in testing this, I believe they can make that available as a beta version if, you, if, you, if there's anything you want to test from there. Uh, but the, um, the goal is to have a proposed new chapter um, in the next few months uh, to the higher capacity committee. We're calling it chapter 38. Um, it doesn't fit into any of the volumes, uh, but it's probably going to come out Assuming the committee is happy with it, it's going to come out as a, uh, an online uh, chapter initially, and then uh, we'll see what happens uh, um, after that. And so, as I said, the computational engine is available from, uh, from McTrans, and uh, we'll be looking into uh, the chapter structure such that we have spillback from arterials to freeways and then spillback from freeways to arterials. So, uh, with that, um, happy to take any questions. I, I believe it is. Um, it was approved. Uh, it is probably available online, but I haven't seen an announcement. It was just approved, so uh, it's uh, based on the uh, the way the system is going to function. It's going to be available online. It may already be. Uh, so perhaps if you go online and uh, since Volume Four is open to everyone, maybe it's there already. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, there's been some studies that are looking at it from uh, from that perspective, and um, the um, there is a new DDI that is being built in Sarasota, and um, my understanding is the studies that they've seen is because the driver doesn't realize this big picture, they're just going through and they don't realize what's happening. They follow the lanes. And so they're really not confused. It's only confusing if you're looking at it from a systems perspective. Yeah, but uh, they seem to operate really well because you reduce the delay significantly. You go from, uh, from three phases to two phases because you only have that, those two at each of the intersections. You don't have the left turn anymore. So it gains a lot of time. Yeah, and it pushes the queues outside the uh, the bridge, so you don't have to accommodate queues within the bridge. It's very, very effective if it's uh, for the right set of demands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.